Welcome back to this presentation of International Plumbing Code Chapter 10, Traps, Interceptors, and Separators. My name is Thomas, and in this presentation, we're going to pick up where we left off, and we're going to go to section 1003. We'll cover that, which is interceptors and separators, and 1004. So let's get to it. All right, section 1003.1 talks about where interceptors are required. You might consider that for a minute. Where do you think you would need a separator? Well, first of all, we might need to ask the question, what are we trying to separate? It gives us a list of the things that you should not be putting down the drain, which includes oil, grease, sand, or other harmful or hazardous substances. Anything that could do damage to the sewer system or the environment, those are not supposed to go down the drain. So we have to find some way to separate those out before the fluid goes down the normal sanitary sewer. 1003.2 talks about approvals. Obviously anything that we're going to install with the intention that it will remove things, uh, it's, it's got to meet some standards. And the code of course requires that we install these things according to the manufacturer's installation instructions. But another provision they have in here is that wastes that do not need to be treated should not be piped through the separator, so they should go around it. Here's an illustration of that. We have that trench drain and an oil separator in a service garage. And in the same service garage, I'll have a sink so that the employees can wash their hands. Well, the trench drain may receive oil or other liquids that need to be separated before it goes down the drain. But the sink is just soapy water. It does not. And so it should be piped in a way that it's not going to pass through the oil separator. We don't need to put any more waste through there than absolutely necessary. 1003.3 talks about grease interceptors, and for many years the most basic type of an interceptor was a concrete vault down in the ground. You can see it illustrated here. From the inlet, the waste would go into the concrete interceptor, and the fats, oils, and grease, that's FOG, would float to the top of the first chamber, and the rest of the liquid is pushed through to the next chamber. Once again, the fats, oils, and grease that's left in that effluent would float to the top, and only the liquids would pass out the bottom on the left here to the outlet. This way, they can separate out all the grease just by gravity. It floats in the liquid, and then periodically, this would have to be cleaned out. So there's going to be some manholes. If you ever drive by a restaurant or a store or a place like that, you'll see these two manholes right next to each other that likely indicates a grease interceptor below ground. Now in restaurants and other locations they may have a grease interceptor that's not buried in a concrete box in the ground but it's actually below a sink or in a basement or somewhere within the building. This is a smaller version that accomplishes the same thing. If you follow this interceptor from left to right the liquid comes in the inlet from the left side and then it is dropped into the tank. The tank has a series of baffles and as the liquid is forced through by gravity, once again the grease or oil floats to the top where it can be separated out and going out the outlet on the right side should just be dirty water. With this device we're able to remove a majority of the grease and keep the drains from getting plugged up from grease. Hey, just a quick caution. If you're ever involved with servicing an operational grease interceptor like this, you need to understand that these are rancid and it will likely ruin your lunch. In 1003.3.1, it talks about grease interceptors and automatic grease removal devices and states that these are required, but you have those options. You can use an interceptor or you can use an automatic grease removal device. We'll look in a minute about the differences there. But here are some of the places that you would be required to install them. This includes restaurants, hotel kitchens, hospitals, school kitchens, cafeterias, and clubs. You can see these are places where you're going to mass produce food and there's going to be a lot of food waste and dishes to do. Some of the fixtures that would be required to go through a grease interceptor or an automatic grease removal device would include pot sinks, pre-rinse sinks, soup kettles, walk stations, floor sinks and floor drains, and dishwashers. 1003.3.2 states that food waste disposers or garbage disposals as we know them 
shall not discharge into a grease interceptor. The reason for that is not because they don't have grease, they do, but because they output so much food waste and they liquefy that, it's going to make a total mess and that will inhibit the grease interceptor's ability to separate out the grease from the rest of that ground up food. Now with a gravity type grease interceptor, there are some products out there that may be used to help the performance, but when it comes to additives, 1003.3.3 states they shall not be installed except where such system dispense microbes for the enhancement of aerobic bioremediation of grease and other organic material. Basically, if you're putting chemicals in there that are killing what's in there, uh, it may not work as well. 1003.3.4 states that grease interceptors and automatic grease removal devices are not required in individual dwellings or private residence. This is why you don't have a grease interceptor in your own house. Now once again, that doesn't mean that grease waste is not going down the drain. In fact, it does. And the less grease you can put down the drain, the better. I've serviced apartments for ignorant college students who pour hamburger grease down the drain and find out that that plugs it up pretty quick. But obviously the less grease we put down, the better. Still on an individual dwelling, there's not as much grease as you're going to find coming from a commercial kitchen, so they don't require the same separation. 1003.3.5 talks about hydromechanical systems. This lists some standards that those would need to meet. And it states once again that we follow the manufacturer's installation instructions. Now, when it comes to the sizing of a grease interceptor, there's a certain relationship here that's demonstrated in Table 1003.3.5.1, and this goes over the capacity of grease interceptors. You'll notice on the left that there is a total flow through rate. This is the amount of fluid that we expect will need to be processed. And then there's the grease retention capacity. That's how much this system can hold as it's pulling that grease out. Now you'll notice here there's a two to one ratio. On the left side for every gallon per minute there's going to be a two pound expectation on the grease retention. So if you've got four gallons per minute it should be able to retain eight pounds and so forth. 1003.3.5.2 talks about the rate of flow controls and it states that grease interceptors shall be equipped with devices to control the flow rate and they have to have a vent that goes at least six inches above the flood level rim. So this way as we're trying to process all that grease we can actually control how much is being processed at a time by slowing the flow. 1003.3.6 talks about automatic grease removal devices. Now these are a little bit different than the gravity type. The gravity type we looked at before is just the principle of the fluid comes into the chamber and the grease floats to the top. But these automatic grease removal devices are going to do a little bit more. Now this is the Big Dipper. This is manufactured for the purpose of removing grease. On their website they call this a grease interceptor. By code it falls a little more into this automatic grease removal device because it's more than just, again, gravity removal. But code requires that any time these are installed, we follow the manufacturer's installation instructions. They have to be sized for all of the fixtures that would be connected. We have to make sure that it can process the uh, volume that we're going to put into it. And also, ready access must be provided. So typically, where you see these would be right in that commercial kitchen. You'll see them, they're easily accessible and easy to maintain. Now companies like this Big Dipper really work to improve the efficiency of removing the grease. So this is going to be better than just typical waiting for gravity and then getting rid of the grease somehow. What this does is it brings that fluid into the first chamber. A basket strainer catches all of the solids. So if there's any food waste or anything left in there, it catches that first. Then the grease and liquid flow into the main chamber where the grease rises to the top by gravity but it's encouraged and liquefied by a heating element. So then it turns really liquid on the top. From there, there's a skimming wheel that pulls that grease off the top and actually puts it for you into a separate chamber. This would be a grease collector that they don't have in the picture, but it's an exterior tank that you can use to haul that grease off somewhere else. This provides a great improvement over the gravity type 
where you kind of just have to let the grease float and then get rid of it every so often. 1003.3.7 gives us a formula for capacity. If we're trying to figure out the capacity of a grease interceptor, we take the peak flow rate in gallons per minute and we would times that by 30 minutes and that gives us an idea of what the capacity would need to be. Shifting gears a little bit here, let's talk about an auto repair shop. It's a different kind of separation we're dealing with. We've looked mainly at food grease separation. This is oil, right? Or gasoline even. 1003.4.1 talks about the separation of liquids and 1003.4.2.1 gives us some specifics about separating the oil. The separator has to have at least a two foot minimum depth and the outlet has to be an 18 inch water seal. So we're creating an extra deep trap here by creating a taller tank. This allows for that oil to separate out to the top. 1003.4.2.2 gives us a requirement for if there's the possibility of gasoline going down the drain. And it says that the tank would need to be not less than six cubic feet per 100 square foot of floor space. That's our minimum. And then if we have a larger floor space than 100 square feet, then we would need an additional one cubic foot for every 100 square feet of space. Now please understand that sounds like a lot when you say 100 square feet, but that's only 10 foot by 10 foot. So imagine like if you're trying to fix a car, a 10 foot by 10 foot square is yeah, barely enough to get a vehicle in there. So these holding tanks, these separators would need to be quite sizable if you have a large shop. So we've talked about grease separation. We've talked about oil separation. The rest of this chapter is dealing with the separation of other things we don't want going down the drain. Tunnel 3.5 talks about sand interceptors. They need to be provided with ready access and have a water seal of not less than six inches. Where would you need a sand interceptor? One example is a dental office. If they're doing any grinding of teeth, they may have a sink that they use to wash and there's gonna be a lot of sediment that can clog the drains. So they'll have a unique trap under there just to catch that grinded sediment. Another example may be a jewelry shop or a place that polishes rocks. 1003.6 talks about clothes washers and the discharge from those can often have string, lint, buttons, who knows what else people put in their pockets, but we need to have an interceptor for that. So especially in a commercial laundromat, there is a requirement for a wire basket or some similar device that can prevent the passage of solids that are a half inch or larger. Again, strings, rags, buttons, whatever could be pumped out of a washing machine but clog the drains. We're trying to catch all of that stuff. Now there are some exceptions to that rule. Once again, we're looking at residential. Similar to the fact that you don't need a grease separator for your kitchen sink, they do not require an interceptor for your private or individual clothes washing machine. So that's the first exception. The second exception states that if it's a clothes washer intended for individual dwelling, it's, it's basically your typical washing machine, but if you install that in a different location, a different setting that's not an individual dwelling, well, it's still the same appliance, so they're not so worried about that. 1003.7 talks about bottling establishments. Broken glass would be a bad thing to have in the drains, so we have to separate broken glass before discharging any of that into the drainage system. 1003.8 talks about slaughterhouses. Very similar. We'd want to prevent the discharge of feathers or entrails or whatever else is coming from those animals that are harvested and keep that from clogging the drains. So some kind of an interceptor would be required there. 1003.9 talks about the venting of interceptors and it says they have to be vented so as not to become airbound. We don't want these to be airlocked so that this fluid can't flow through. International Plumbing Code Chapter 9 gives us a lot more information about how to create vents that will allow for airflow. 1003.10 talks about access and maintenance. Any of these interceptors or separators would have to be accessible so that maintenance can be performed. This section states that that maintenance basically means you go and you pull that grease and scum out every so often. And finally, we get to 1004, which talks about materials. And this chapter has very little to say about that because they just say, look, if you want to know more about materials on sinks or fixtures, 
or about drainage systems and the materials for that, you can go to chapter four and chapter seven of International Plumbing Code, Enough Said. All right, that concludes this presentation of International Plumbing Code, chapter 10 on traps, interceptors, and separators. Going forward, make sure that you install traps correctly and install the right types of traps. Also, if you're ever involved with grease interceptors, separators, make sure to plug your nose. I'll see you next time.